Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And I'd like to welcome you all to the 79th Pearl Harbor Commemoration Ceremony. I am Lieutenant Commander Ueda, US Naval Staff College student from Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force and the master of ceremonies for today's event. The purpose of this ceremony is the remembrance of Pearl Harbor and to memorize Pearl Harbor as symbol of tolerance, reconciliation, and friendship. We hope this ceremony will be a great opportunity for us to think about war and peace. We are very glad your attendance, Rear Admiral Chatfield, Retired Admiral Swift, Captain Sano, Dr. Farrell, and Professor Chisholm as guest speakers. Also, I'd like to note that we have participants from Japan mainland, such as Mr. Bonji Ohara, Senior Fellow of Sasaka Peace Foundation. And we'd like to express our gratitude, not only for us and Japan, but also for the Admiral and participants of other countries. The United States and Japanese national anthem will now be played. It's my honor to present Rear Admiral Shoshana Chatfield, 57th President of the United States Naval War College. Thank you. It is an honor and a privilege to be here with you this evening. I'd like to also recognize Captain Sano from the Naval Attaché Embassy of Japan in the United States and Canada. Captain Dolan, the president of Japan America Navy Friendship Association, Dr. Farrell, and to our wonderful community of faculty, staff, 
students and friends, all of whom are such great supporters of our Japanese and American community here. On this Pearl Harbor Day, we remember that on December 7th in 1941, without a declaration of war and without explicit warning, Japanese Imperial Naval Air Service attacked in Pearl Harbor and damaged all eight of the US Navy battleships docked inside the harbor. Three cruisers, three destroyers, an anti-aircraft training ship and a mine layer were destroyed. Additionally, 188 aircraft, 2,403 sailors, troops and civilians were lost along with 1,178 injured. The very next day, President Franklin D. Roosevelt addressed the United States, the nation, at a joint session of Congress and called on legislators to approve a declaration of war against Japan. This was a day that both Japan and the United States will remember, a period of hostilities. Within the United States, prejudice-fueled rumors then spread, targeting Japanese Americans. Many American media outlets, including Fortune, Time Magazine, The New York Times, Newsweek, and Los Angeles Times, began to characterize the enemy, utilizing very harsh terms and stereotyped terms. Those carried on to Japanese immigrants and their American born children. Two months after the attack, President Roosevelt signed executive order 9066, initiating an evacuation of all Japanese Americans from the West Coast of the United States. This resulted in the creation of internment camps across the country, where approximately 120,000 people, many American citizens, were held for years during World War II. And those events are a matter of history. They're a matter of our official record. But as we look back at that period and those years, we look back with the gift of time and understanding and the many overtures that have been made since the cessation of hostilities. And what is remarkable in this period after such a devastating conflict that this alliance between Japan and the United States now forms the cornerstone of a free and open Indo-Pacific. And we're so honored to be a part of that every day here at the Naval War College. It has been 79 years and since 1957, the Naval War College has hosted 125 Japanese students. We have hosted 71 admirals, 14 Japanese heads of the uh, Maritime Defense Forces. And every class has had as a student at least one Japanese student. Today, our Alliance has brought together a multitude of programs. These are cooperation uh, based programs. We have memoranda of understanding between the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force Command and Staff College and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. And last year, we held a wonderful event called Bridging the Straits. And we have hosted the Princess Akiko. And 
It has been such a fruitful extension of our understanding of each other and our support for each other. These actions are but a few of the actions that have strengthened an existing relationship and strengthened our alliance. Every year here at the Naval War College, we host a war game, the Northwest Pack game. And we are so delighted every two years to host uh, the International Sea Power Symposium and to receive the highest level of leadership here. And we also support the Asia Pacific Navy Planning Process International Course. This important work here at the Naval War College supports this historic and important alliance. As we walk our campus on the north side of the Stanfield Turner walkway, affixed to the wall for all to see, it says, it reads, since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that defenses of peace must be constructed. And so it is our job here at the US Naval War College to keep that wonderful phrase in mind as we conduct our important work and focus on our strong relationship with each other. As scholars and historians, we study the past to better inform and understand the present. And that understanding guides us into the future. Our future is bright because today we are here together to recognize our faults and our strengths, to remember those who suffered and to move forward together, linked arm in arm on behalf of our shared national security. I want to thank the NCC class and Captain Tanaka for inviting me to this commemoration ceremony. I am grateful to all those who annually organize and support this tradition of remembrance this willingness to come together to accept and recognize those things that among us are similar and among us are dif different, but yet motivate us to remain dedicated to each other, to all of our Pacific neighbors, to work together in strength of alliance to prevent the next generation from ever experiencing another war by standing vigil, vigilant in the security and freedom of an open Indo-Pacific. Thank you again for coming this evening to this important event. Thank you very much, Admiral Chatfield. Please let me introduce retired Admiral Scott Swift, the honorary chairman of the US-Japan Navy Friendship Association Newport. He was received his commission in 1979 as aviation officer he was assigned as commander of a carrier strike group, 7th Fleet and Pacific Fleet. He participated in Iraqi Freedom and many other operations. Admiral Swift is unable to join us today, but provided us with his remarks last week.
Good evening. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Janaffa Newport uh, leadership and uh, members of Janaffa Newport for all the great work that they do uh, supporting the relationship that we enjoy uh, with Japan, we being the U.S. Navy, and of course recognizing that uh, Janaffa Newport is a joint organization as well. Uh, I regret that uh, I can't be there in person virtually, but uh, I've got a conflict of events that uh, has me recording this uh, prior to uh, December 7th. But there's uh, a few points that I want to make. One is uh, from a historical perspective uh, of December 7th and, and what it means to uh, us today, uh, a present perspective and a future perspective. So from a past perspective, I'd like to share a story of uh, two individuals that, that fought in uh, World War II on opposing sides. One was an officer in the Imperial Navy, in fact, a naval aviator in the Imperial Navy, uh, another was uh, a young officer in the U.S. Navy, a surface warfare officer. Um, and they, they fought against each other throughout uh, World War II, not necessarily directly individually, but certainly uh, collectively. Um, and, and then from a, a present perspective, uh, reflecting on those two individuals, um, they both survived the war, they had families, and both of them continued in their military careers. Um, they had children, uh, including a son. Uh, one of their sons uh, grew up eventually to be uh, the commander and, and chief of the self-defense fleet and went on to be the uh, chief of the Maritime Self-Defense Force and eventually chief of the Self-Defense Force, and that, of course, was Admiral Kawano. The other, the other officer's son uh, grew up in the military, in the Navy, um, became the 7th Fleet Commander and eventually the Pacific Fleet Commander, um, and that was me. And those two sons served together. When Admiral Kawano was sink us to fleet, I was 7th Fleet. In the context of that experience, out of the ashes of World War II, that these two young officers serving their respective countries uh, came together to serve at the same time together in the interest of ensuring uh, the stability of the Indo-Asia Pacific. I'm reminded as well today of the efforts of Prime Minister Abe in his free and open Pacific, uh, a concept that many have embraced uh, around the Indo-Asia Pacific uh, to include uh, the United States. And then as we look to the future, uh, we tend to look to the future historically uh, with a sense of uncertainty. Uh, of concern about where we may be going. I look to the future with optimism. The experiences that I shared of, of my family and my experience, Emma Kuano's family and his experience, is not unique. It's emblematic of what comes from democracies. Yes, countries can have clashes, but as long as there's this, this sense of this democratic foundation, this, this ideal that we serve something bigger than ourselves, that indeed the militaries that we serve are bigger than just the militaries. They serve in the service of countries. That's what December 7th does for us. It's an opportunity to look back on where we've come from, what has made us who we are today, and what our role is in the future. It's a part of what Naval, uh, the uh, uh, Naval War College is all about, and it's certainly a part of what uh, JANAF is all about. So I thank you very much for allowing me to share a few words um, and I look forward to hearing more about this, this celebration, this yearly celebration that we have of the example that these two countries, Japan and the United States, has set for so many to follow in our footsteps when we find ourselves in conflict. Thank you. Thank you very much, Admiral. Next, we are pleased to have Captain Sano the Naval Attaché of Embassy of Japan in the United States and Canada, with us to deliver remarks. He is a tactical coordinator of P3C, and he graduated U.S. Naval Staff College in 2014. Notably, he is the first Naval Attaché graduated U.S. Naval War College after World War II. Captain Sano, please proceed. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, uh, thank you very much, Lieutenant Commander Ueda. Uh, I'm honored to have the opportunity to make some remarks at today's uh, Pearl Harbor commemoration 
ceremony program. My presence here as the Naval Attaché for Japan is only possible because of our bond with the US and our pledge to continue to strengthen our alliance. I would like to express our sincere gratitude to everyone in attendance and of course to everyone at JANAPA for organizing this program. Although COVID-19 continues to present unique challenges, I'm committed to maintaining and enhancing a strong Japan-US alliance. Today marks the commemoration of the tragedy at Pearl Harbor. I offer my sincere condolences to those who lost their lives on this day, now 79 years ago. Former Prime Minister Abe in the 2016 Pearl Harbor commemoration reflected on the split of tolerance embraced by the American people. I'm reminded of the earthquake that stacked Japan on March 11, 2011 with a 9.0 magnitude, the biggest in our nation's recent history. The resulting tsunami devastated our infrastructure and killed over 18,000 people. The US, in the response to the desolation, showed empathy and extended their hand across the sea to provide aid and support to the Japanese people in what was known as Operation Tomodachi, the Japanese word for friend. Next year, we'll mark the 10th anniversary of that disaster. To reference Abe's words once more, I would like to say that the split of tolerance transforms to the spirit of empathy. Operation Tomodachi acted out in the spirit of empathy further the kizuna or band between the US and Japan. President Obama, in response to Prime Minister Abe said, the character of nation is tested in war, but it is defined in peace. As we continue our vow, we continue our quest for peace and so defines the essence of our nation. As a graduate of the Naval War College class of 2014, my memories of Newport are especially precious. These memories were made in part by the relationship between Commander Darlene McClag's family and my own. As a mentor, Commander McClag provided me with a foundation of support. I'm privileged to have had that honor which further show me that an alliance is based not solely on governmental or Navy to Navy relationships, but on the efforts made and the empathy given from one person to another. In these times of increasing uncertainty, our alliance depends a great deal on our maritime liaison and place to security. Through reconciliation, Japan and the US have grown together to pursue peace, prosperity, and our commitments to liberty. The respectful Robert Gates, former SecDef, expressed it this way. The alliance is based not just on economic and military necessity, but on shared values. I'd like to thank Janafa Newport once again for this opportunity to foster that bond. Captain Hiroyuki Hirosano, thank you. Thank you very much, Captain Sano. It's my mm -hmm. honor to ask Dr. William Farrell, Honorary Consul of Japan at Newport, to give us a few words. Since 1966, he served for 20 years in the US Air Force as a commissioned officer specializing in counterintelligence and security matters. After military career, he experienced the faculty of US Naval War College, executive director of American Chamber of Commerce of Japan, advanced research fellow in Harvard University, chairman and CEO of Dynamic Strategies Asia, chairman of National Association of Japan America Societies 
and present assignment. He has great, made great contribution to building US-Japan relationship. Dr. Farrell, please proceed. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me all right? Okay. <laughs> uh, once again, thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here. Uh, I've been involved, as you say, with Japan since 1969, which was my first assignment over there. And uh, while I was at the Naval War College, I sponsored, I think, nine Japanese officers over the years and uh, got to know them and their families very, very well. One of the things that strikes me about Pearl Harbor of uh, what a day it meant for Japanese American citizens here in the United States. A lot of them within a few months found themselves being interned and uh, placed in various camps. And by going to Japan and serving there in the mid 1960s and 70s, there were still a lot of Japanese Americans who had been involved in the Philippines, who had been interpreters when the Marines went from island to island. And uh, they had lots of experiences to talk. and. Uh, it was very interesting to learn from them. Uh, in 1969, uh, I guess in Japanese, that would be Mukashi Mukashi. Uh, I was assigned to uh, an air station called Wakanai in the northern part of Japan. And uh, my good friend, Brian Yoshiaki Shiroyama was a chief of security police. So you had two guys in their mid twenties I was the OSI agent or NCIS equivalent, and he was chief of security police. So we didn't have too many friends. <laughs> we had a lot, each other. And um, one of the big things that was important was the stories that he and his wife, Jane Shiriyama, who was also a Japanese American related. Jane's father was a Buddhist priest in Hawaii. And Pearl Harbor meant that evening that the FBI and the police showed up and carried him off. And uh, the family didn't know where he was for two years. Uh, and um, Jane's mother used to go to bed at night by pushing the chest of drawers against the door and laying with her back there and the two children uh, in her arms. And finally, after two years, they found out that uh, their father was at Crystal City, uh, Texas. And that was one of the camps that was run by the FBI and the Department of Justice, which was different than other internment camps. And he was able to uh, finally, they were finally reunited as a family. But one of the things that was interesting about the Crystal City camp was that they also had Germans and Italians there. So the Germans and the Japanese occasionally would get together. And unfortunately, Brian's wife, Jane, uh, developed cancer and passed away in 2003. But soon thereafter, her husband received a phone call from a German-American lady. And she had read the obituary and realized that Jane's mother was at the same camp as her mother. And her mother was ill and uh, Jane's mother had nursed her for years and years. So it's an interesting uh, dynamic that takes place for a lot of these uh, families of the Nisei. When the war started at, uh, after Pearl Harbor, uh, my friend Brian's family was uh, ordered to a camp and stayed at Manzanar, which is in California. And then he was really mad at the United States, the father was. So he immediately went back on one of the Liberty ships to Yokohama, Japan, took the family with him. And his older, Brian's older brother had a ruptured appendix and couldn't get proper medical attention. So his father got really mad at Japan and put his family back on a boat and they came to California. And uh, Jane's father, excuse me, uh, Brian's father uh, worked for the US government Department of Defense and retired as a senior GS uh, grade. And Brian went into the Air Force after that. And it was very interesting because he shared a lot of uh, experiences uh, of life in camp and the like. And the fact that the father and the son, after being interned and forced into one of these camps, et cetera, uh, both wound up serving the US government. Uh, 
One of the things that I still remember uh, vividly is way back in the 1960s, uh, one evening, uh, the base commander and uh, Brian Shiriyama, the chief of security police, and I were invited to a dinner with Japanese nationals there, the head of the maritime and the air and uh, ground self-defense forces. So we had a lovely dinner. And during the dinner, you, I noticed that the senior maritime self-defense officer kept staring at Brian. And then uh, finally the room went quiet and uh, it was uh, at that time, Commander Kamiya. He looked at Brian and he said, you were my student in the fifth grade in Yokohama, I remember you. And the room went very, very quiet. And so the relationships that oftentimes build up from the damnedest places sometimes are very, very important in our relationship with Japan. And uh, one of the things that uh, we have the 442nd, which is Japanese Americans who fought in Europe. You had the MIS, the military intelligence service that went from island to island with the Marines. And uh, eventually, by the time I got to Japan for the first time, these were all colonels in the Army or the Air Force, and they provided a lot of personal experience. Uh, so I think it's important that we recognize how Japanese Americans were true citizens in suffered some extreme hardships, but still felt very important to serve our nation. And I think that's my three minute comments for the day. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Farrell. Next, please let me introduce Professor Daniel Chisholm, Faculty of Naval War College, Joint Military Operation Department. He earned his Bachelor of Arts, Master of Arts, and a PhD in political science from the University of California. He published lots of researches, addresses, operational planning, military personnel system, cognitive and organizational limits on rationality and so on. Recently, he received the Joint Meritorious Civilian Service Award 2014. Today, Professor Chisholm gave us a historical lecture about Pearl Harbor. Professor Chisholm, please proceed. Thank you, Commander Ueda. Admiral Chatfield, Captain Sano, Captain Vito, Captain Tanaka, Dr. Farrell, Captain Ship, Captain Marston, and Captain Deline. It's my honor and privilege to be here this evening. I hope you'll take this more as an informal talk than a, uh, a lecture. There'll be no test following and no, uh, no pop quizzes as far as I know. Uh, I've been asked to offer a few thoughts on the significance of Pearl Harbor, both with regard to World War II and with regard to the history since that time. The attack on Pearl Harbor, now a distant eight decades, it's difficult to fathom, was part of a multidimensional plan to secure the resources in Southeast Asia, Manchuria, and China, essential to Japanese economic self-sufficiency. Japan's leadership had become increasingly convinced that given the economic sanctions imposed on it by the US to include embargo of oil and iron, in consequence of its actions in China, the only viable course of action to develop Japan's Economy was the use of military force to secure those resources. Some in Asia and overturn an international regime dominated. I see I'm, I've got some internet issues apparently. Can you hear me okay? You're, okay, am I back? My apologies. I think we have uh, limited bandwidth at my house. Can you hear me? You... Yes, I can hear you. Uh, I wonder if we could ask some participants uh, to secure your video while uh, Professor Chisholm is talking and he may have a little bit easier time with his own bandwidth. Thank and, you. Uh, and Professor Chisholm, I turned off your video as well. That's fine. It'll just be a disembodied voice from this point forward. 
So I'm not quite sure when I went, uh, I went off. Uh, let, me, let me start with a, a previous paragraph and pick up from there. My apologies for this. Japan's leadership had become increasingly convinced that given economic sanctions imposed on it by its major trading partner, the US, to include embargo of oil and iron, in consequence of its actions in China, that the only viable course of action to develop and sustain their economy was the use of military force to get those resources. Some in Japan's leadership also saw an opportunity to reduce, if not eliminate, the influence of the European colonial powers in Asia and to overturn an international regime they saw as dominated by Western states, particularly Britain and the United States. So based on its positive historical experiences in the Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War, Japan sought a limited war of limited duration for limited objectives that they believed would be concluded by negotiations leaving them better off than before the war. This they would achieve by rocking the US back on its heels, by destroying or rendering inoperable the principal assets of the US Pacific Fleet, thus Pearl Harbor. Erecting island barriers in the Central and South Pacific to protect the Southern resources area would render it too costly for the US to penetrate the Central Pacific in order to compel the Japanese to relinquish their newly conquered territories. And by basing the mobile fleet at Truk and the Carolines so that it could use interior lines of communication to respond decisively to any US threat that might come. So at the tactical level, it proved a great victory. The US Pacific Fleet's battleships then considered its main striking force were sunk or badly damaged. Many aircraft were destroyed. At the same time, the US carriers were at sea at the time of the attack and the fuel oil farms in Hawaii went untouched. At the operational level for Japan, it brought the time necessary to consolidate gains in the Southern resources area and to take the Philippines. However, the attack precipitated as such events often do, profound change in US military leadership which new commanders proved extremely capable in the conduct of a war for unlimited objectives of long duration, primarily naval in character to be achieved through economic blockade by sea and air and by invasion only if necessary. The concepts for which were already well-developed and clearly articulated by 1928 in the Navy's war plan, Orange. At the same time, by force of circumstance, Pearl Harbor accelerated the US shift from battleships to aircraft carriers as its capital ships. It also stimulated the US to conduct unrestricted submarine warfare, largely against Japan's merchant marine, a critical requirement both to carry resources to Japan and to transport troops and military supplies to its barrier islands. The merchant marine also proved a critical vulnerability. And because US aircraft carriers remained intact, an assault on Midway would be conducted just six months later in order to ensure their destruction. It was not a favorable outcome for Japan. And finally, the great success at Pearl Harbor combined with the relative speed and ease with which the Southern resources area was secured would leave Japanese leadership with an unwarranted optimism about the war, which led to overreach with operations aimed at Port Moresby and Guadalcanal that would threaten the sea lines of communication to Australia. Ultimately, at the strategic level, it achieved most nearly the opposite outcome that the Japanese intended. Pearl Harbor might appropriately be considered an information operation or strategic communication from Japan to the United States. The attack greatly inflamed US public opinion, which considered it naively perhaps, given the many events since, a dastardly underhanded move, the first attack on US territory since the British burned Washington during the War of 1812. Rather than persuade the US to come to the negotiating table, however, the US, with a population several times the size of Japan, an industrial economy of the same disproportionate size, chose to conduct an unlimited war. In the context, US leaders could scarcely have done otherwise. 
The Pearl Harbor attack had left entirely untouched the great flow of ships and aircraft already in the industrial pipeline. A flow started in 1938, accelerated in June 1940, and destined to become even greater during the war, one with which Japan's industrial base simply could not compete. By mid-1943, one heavy carrier per month was sliding down the shipyard ways, with the concomitant air groups, escorts, logistic ships, not to mention a vast fleet of amphibious vessels that had hardly even been conceptualized in 1941. The military personnel pipeline alone was prodigious by any measure. In this sense, that the, it may be said that the Japanese had probably reached strategic culmination at the very moment the Kuido Butai launched its attack on Pearl Harbor. Though that fact became evident only by 1943 to some and to others not until 1944. If the US found the will to conduct the war, its overwhelming advantage in population and resources would see it through. And so it did. A bitterly fought conflict on both sides and the world was remade. Today at a remove of four generations in the United States and Japan, what, we, what may we say about the significance of Pearl Harbor? At one level, Virtually all of those who fought the war, whether Japanese or American, are gone, leaving the raw, visceral memories of that war behind. For many young people, Pearl Harbor, and indeed World War II, barely register today. And what they know of those events is very little. And perhaps this is as it should be. But Japan and the United States have not simply gone their own way at peace, but wary of each other. Rather, in the decades since 1945, Americans and Japanese have increasingly found, have found common ground, begun in security concerns they shared during the Cold War. But their common ground extends well beyond specific collective security interests. As others have noted, they are both liberal democracies with free market economies. They both support an international regime that is arguably provided the longest period of relative international peace and economic prosperity in modern history. Now, of course, common security interests have again become especially relevant. Still, it remains the underlying foundation of common values that knits together Japan and the United States. Born of a great conflagration, but testament to the power of time and people of goodwill who reach across vast oceans. Though it is famously said that people have friends while states have interests, states do not act, people act. Japanese and Americans have formed and maintained a remarkable partnership, evidenced in part by this evening's event, representative of a long, special, and powerful relationship between the Naval War College and Japan's Maritime Self-Defense Force as organizations, initiated, however, as we've seen, by no less than Admiral Arleigh Burke but also personal relationships formed here in Newport, sustained over the years, have done much to cement Japan and American relations. Pearl Harbor signifies today that even the most difficult events of the past may with time and people of foresight and goodwill be overcome and even provide a foundation for, for friendship. This evening's event testifies to that. 79 years ago this evening, my father spent a few hours with his college roommate at the Claremont Hotel in Oakland, California, thinking about, discussing, and wondering what would be the next years. What would they do? My father was a destroyer man at the time. Now, 79 years later, teaching at the War College for some time, I've had a number of extraordinary Japanese officers as students. And although I have not served overseas with the Japanese forces as Admiral Swift did, I feel very much the same type of connection that he described. And I think that the beauty of this event this evening is that it makes possible the expansion of such relationships over, over time into the future. Thank you very much for your time and attention. It was an honor to be here. Thank you for a great lecture, Professor Chizam. Now, on behalf of U.S. student of Naval Command College, U.S. Air Force, Colonel Matthew Altman, 
will deliver a remembrance. Thank you. Admiral Chatfield, Admiral Swift, Captain Sano, Dr. Farrell, Dr. Chisholm, fellow Naval Command, Naval Staff, and Naval War College students, ladies and gentlemen, it's a sincere honor to be able to participate in this ceremony on behalf of my fellow students and leaders in the profession of arms. As we remember and pay respect to all those who were lost to Pearl Harbor 79 years ago and the many fierce battles that followed that infamous day. While it's a solemn occasion to recognize the eternal sacrifices made on both sides, I am heartened by the strong French friendship that has developed between the United States and Japan in the decades since. What started that day as our most reviled enemy has become one of our strongest and most loyal allies. It's, and it's important that we take a moment to appreciate that fact as we honor the past today. It's particularly special for us to be able to recognize that significant historical event together as American and Japanese service members joined arm in arm at the Naval War College, along with so many of our collective allies in pursuit of relationships, scholarship, and friendships. As we've heard today, the Battle of Pearl Harbor was a devastating event with over 350 Japanese aircraft destroying or damaging 19 American ships and 188 aircraft. In total, over 2,400 Americans and 129 Japanese service members were killed. Many more were wounded. Personally, I didn't have anyone from my family involved in Pearl Harbor, but I am extremely proud that my grandfather and his three brothers served our nation and the Allied cause simultaneously during World War II. They even had representation in each of the services at the time, with my grandfather in the Marine Corps, his brother Henry in the Navy, brother Rogers in the Army, and brother Ernst in the Army Air Corps which would eventually become my future service. As proud as I am of my own personal legacy of military service, born in World War II, it's not uncommon for many Americans at the time. And I imagine similar legacies brought each of you into service as well. World War I may have been the United States' first involvement in conflict in the world stage, but World War II, World War II beginning with this attack on our homeland, established an entire generation of patriots who loved our country and found unity in American values values the entire nation would rally around in the months after Pearl Harbor and throughout our involvement in the Second World War. Values that would establish the foundation for so many strong partnerships with like-minded free countries all over the world. As former President Barack Obama once said as he visited the USS Arizona Memorial with Japanese Prime Minister Abe in 2016, at Pearl Harbor, America came of age, a generation of Americans, the greatest generation. They did not seek war, but they refused to shrink from it. And they all did their part on fronts and in factories. And while the proud ranks of Pearl Harbor survivors had thinned with time, the bravery we recall here is forever etched in our national heart. As practitioners and scholars of military operations, we all must learn from events like Pearl Harbor during our studies at the Naval War College in order to effectively help shape national policy and preserve our nation's trust, legitimacy, sons, daughters, and treasure in pursuit of military objectives. Today, like every day, we honor and remember Pearl Harbor. We honor all those heroes on both sides who were lost, and we pray that our collective friendships and alliances across the world will prevent conflict of this magnitude from ever happening again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colonel Altman. On behalf of Japanese students at Naval Command College, Captain Masaomi Tanaka will deliver a remembrance. Nice to meet you, ladies and gentlemen, Madam Sir. This is Captain Tanaka from Japan as NCC students. I would like to pay mourning humbly to the tragedy of Pearl Harbor. Remember Pearl Harbor. This is a too famous American slogan. 79 years ago today, the Pacific War began at Pearl Harbor and the United States fought under this slogan for about four years, ended World War. Throughout the Pacific War, not only the losers, but also the winners were deeply hurt. Regardless of their flags, all soldiers' motivation to fight would have been the love for their homeland and the desire to protect their family and friends. We would like to express our deepest respect and condolences to all the soldiers who fell into the war with a noble sense of mission and responsibility. 
for 75 years after the end of the Pacific War, the world has yet to have permanent peace. But we are steadily on the road to prosperity. This world is established on the sacrifice of soldiers who have fallen into war. As national security professionals, we must continue our efforts for this continuous progress with their memories. The Naval Command College I am studying now was founded by Admiral Ari Burke in 1956 to 57. And regardless of the difference of national policy and culture, we can learn for the pursuit of world peace and stability and deep in friendship with our classmates around the world. Also, this year is the 60th anniversary of the conclusion of the security treaty between the United States and Japan, which was fought. And we are making efforts together for world peace under the strong relationship. These are indeed symbols of tolerance reconciliation and friendship, and these are connected to Pearl Harbor, where is the place of all beginning. We will never forget Pearl Harbor and those who fell in all battles. We pray for their souls to rest in peace. And we pledge to their souls to make efforts for peace and prosperity in both Japan and the United States and the world. With, with the slogan, remember Pearl Harbor as a common language of Japan and the United States. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Captain Tanaka. Taps and Umi Yukaba will now be played Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's ceremony. As Captain Love Darling mentioned in chat here, Japan American Friendship Society has a mission to promote the US-Japan Naval Alliance and foster greater friendship. 
if you are interested in joining, please send email from a non-government account to Gmail, janafa.newport at gmail.com. We thank you for joining us. Thank you.